want to welcome you to St. Norbert College. I'm Tom Kunkel. I'm the president of uh, St. Norbert. And we are delighted to have you here for the second edition of A Mirror of Our Culture, Sport, and Society in America, which is co-hosted by St. Norbert College and our friends across town, the Green Bay Packers. Uh, first thing I want to do, we're fortunate in that we've got folks from all around America, but we also have uh, four or five folks who, are, who have joined us uh, from other countries. And I just want to take a minute and acknowledge them uh, uh, from down under, quite a way, from, from um, the Department of Education in Victoria, Australia, Danny Forrest and Andrew Perry. You gentlemen here? Welcome. From Micah, uh, from University of King's College in Halifax, up in Canada, Micah Ansh Anshin. Micah? Welcome. How do you actually pronounce your last name, Micah? That was, that was good. Not too bad? Okay. <laughs> uh, from the University of Constance in Germany, Amber Griffin. Griffin. Hi, Amber. And how do you actually pronounce your last name? Griffune. Griffune, thank you. And finally, from National Chengqing University of Taiwan, Mr. Joe Eaton. Joe, welcome. Well, like I said, we all of you are welcome. Glad to have you, and we're especially appreciative of those of you who have come so far. Uh, want to. Uh, to take a moment and thank our sponsors of our conference, the Center for Ethical Youth Coaching, CEYC, which is dedicated to promoting ethical coaching principles in youth sports and as a result creating a fun, safe, and beneficial environment for youth athletes. The International Sports Professionals Association, or ISPA, is the largest international accreditation body for professionals serving athletes and athletic communities worldwide. The Neville Public Museum in downtown Green Bay is currently hosting football, the exhibit, sponsored by the Green Bay Packers. And additional thanks to Independent Printing for helping to underwrite the cost of the conference program. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker here in just a minute, but I really do want to just say a word about how pleased we are to have you here. Uh, I just finished my fourth year at St. Norbert College, and shortly after I got here, my colleague, our academic dean, Dr. Mike Marsden uh, came to me with an idea that Mike had actually had for some time, uh, and partly because Mike uh, came out of the, the fairly new discipline of popular culture was his field, and he helped establish that field in the academy. Um, and Mike just had had a notion for a long time, you know, here we are, uh, you know, with this relationship with the Packers, uh, which is such a unique franchise in every way in professional sports and so grounded in community and we're living in a time where sports is so uh, influential in every aspect of our culture and increasingly in ways that you know we can even debate how healthy that is how obsessive we've become but the fact is is that it's just become this incredible uh, social force and yet um, you know, there really aren't conferences out there that talk about this. Wouldn't it be amazing if the Packers and St. Norbert went together to host a conference about this? And I thought, yeah, that would be amazing uh, and fun. And uh, we approached the Packers, uh, Mark Murphy, um, you know, with the idea. And I think in large part because Mark came out of, you know, college himself. He was a former athletic director. Uh, at several institutions, uh, he, he loved the idea. And so two years ago, we were able to do the first conference on sport and society, and a number of you, I recognize, you know, were there. And when we debriefed, we felt like, you know, it had gone so well, and it was such an important subject, and the Packers thought it had gone very well, that we agreed we would do it again. We wanted to give it a little bit of a breather. But we're so pleased to be able to do uh, this encore presentation, if you will, and I, I just know that you're going to enjoy it as much as the folks, uh, the attendance, uh, attendees did the first time around. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce 
uh, this afternoon speaker who's going to be with you for the rest of the conference in various ways, kind of as the master of ceremonies. Um, Wayne Larrabee has just finished his 13th season as the voice of the Packers on the Packers radio network. Wayne grew up as a fan of the Packers in his native Lee, Massachusetts, which we'll have to figure out how that happened, but we're going to have a Q&A when he's done. So he's now entering his 34th consecutive year broadcasting NFL games, having joined Green Bay's broadcast team 14 seasons after 14 seasons as the radio voice of the Chicago Bears from 85 to 98 on WGN and WMAQ Radio in Chicago. Earlier, he'd done play-by-play -play for the Kansas City Chiefs for seven years in Kansas, uh, on KCMO Radio in Kansas City. Known for his uh, thorough preparation and his moderated yet enthusiastic call of the action, Wayne's more recent credits also include play-by-play -play for the Big Ten Conference football and basketball for the Big Ten Network and ESPN Regional co-hosting the nationally syndicated Pro Football Weekly radio program the past 20 years, and calling games for the Chicago Cubs. He also served as play-by-play -play announcer of the Chicago Bulls basketball on WGN-TV from 91 to 2008, and for the NCAA basketball on Westwood One CBS Sports Radio. He's a 1977 graduate of Emerson College in Boston, where he was awarded the school's Alumni Achievement Award in June 2005. And if you live, for those of you who live in Green Bay, you know that if you're listening to the Packers, the game is never really and truly over until you hear, and there's your dagger, which I think is one of the great signature calls in all of sports. And I have to say, it was especially wonderful, uh, that game in Dallas, where he was able to say, finally, there's your Super Bowl dagger. I'm sure that was one of the highlights of his, uh, many highlights in a great career. Please join me in welcoming Wayne Larrabee. Wayne. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, it is great to be here, first and foremost, uh, a mirror of our culture, sport, and society. I, I don't know how many times in uh, different uh, platforms that I've worked on that I've often marveled over the, the fact and, and that, you know, sports is merely a microcosm of our society in many ways. So uh, when the folks here asked me if I wanted to be a part of this, I thought, well, you know, that, that would be a real interesting thing to kind of go up and dive into and, and see if what they think uh, coincides with what I think. And, um, you know, so I'm pleased and, and happy and honored to be here. And by the way, and I am ashamed to say this, uh, I've never been on this campus until uh, really today, to be honest with you, uh, because I've had no reason to. I know the Packers stay here, but they train over in Green Bay at the stadium during training camp, and uh, members of the media are not allowed here during training camp. So uh, I've never been on this gorgeous campus, and I was just lost a few minutes ago uh, trying to get over here from the Crest Inn, and boy, it's hard to get lost in that short amount of time from one two block area to another, but I certainly was had a chance to walk through the common area here and everything. What a, a gorgeous campus you have here. This is, is really spectacular. Um, and you know, the other thing I've noticed is so many people, um, you, your recruiters have done a great job of uh, recruiting, certainly Milwaukee, several people that live in our, my neighborhood uh, go to school here. And, uh, Chicago as well um, has been good to St. Norbert's, I know, uh, recently, and, and uh, it, it's easy to see why. What an idyllic place to go to school, it, it really is. Um, you're probably wondering, those of you, especially those of you from around here, as to a couple of things uh, that Tom talked about. Number one, how do you grow up in western Massachusetts and become a fan of the Green Bay Packers? Well. That's pretty uh, simple. The Packers, and I know that for those of you who are natives may not like this, but they transcend Green Bay. Uh, they transcend Green Bay to the state of Wisconsin and beyond the state of Wisconsin since the Lombardi era, since the advent of color TV in America, the Green Bay Packers have become one of those national teams. And they really are. And in the 60s, they were the team that was on the second game of the doubleheader. We always had to sit through the New York Giants game 
the first game of the doubleheader. But then you got Green Bay, San Francisco. Green Bay, Baltimore was a huge rivalry back in the 60s. Green Bay, Chicago, still the greatest rivalry of all time. So that's what I focused in on. And, the, and, and I will say this about, and this is why some of you are in the marketing end of the business, and this is why you are what you are. Why did I become a Green Bay Packers fan? Well, when I was five years old in 1960, I just, I saw, I had a lunchbox, an NFL lunchbox. And my favorite colors in the first place were green and gold. But then I saw that gold helmet with a G on the side of it. And as a little kid, I thought, wow, that's, that's a really cool insignia. That is really neat. And from then on, that's why I became a Packers fan. Now, it just so happened, they were in the process of winning five world championships in eight years. That helped, but the fact is I was tied to the uniform. And that's what marketing's all about today. That's why teams change their, their look, their, in some cases their color, some cases their insignia. But let me tell you something, the great teams, the great teams never change, okay? If you were to, to have a throwback weekend, the New York Yankees and Boston Red Sox throwback weekend, the New York Yankees would be wearing the same uniforms for throwback weekend as they do today. The uniform never changes. Penn State football, Green Bay Packers, Chicago Bears, the uniform, there may be variations a little bit, but it doesn't change. The great teams, their uniforms remain the same. The great franchises, they don't have to change. Pittsburgh doesn't have to change its look and its colors. They have variations, but the colors and the look, it's all there. The great teams. Now, after the 60s, the Packers went through the, uh, I like to refer to it as, uh, uh, and I'm Catholic, so excuse me if I if get this wrong, but it, it was kind of akin to the Israelites matriculating across the Red Sea into the desert for 40 years except that, that our matriculation was about 25 years, from 1967 to about 1992-93, when this franchise got turned around by a couple of key individuals, two of whom you'll hear from tomorrow. But, you know, since the Holmgren Packers, since Brett Favre, since Reggie White, and thank God, God told him to go to Green Bay, that and about three more million dollars than San Francisco was offering at the time, <laughs> But you know, I mean, hey, it's hard to say no to God and an extra $3 million, especially if he's bringing that to the party. But Reggie White, Brett Favre, Bob Harlan, Ron Wolf, Mike Holmgren, not in any kind of order necessarily, but those are the people who turned this franchise around. And a somewhat dormant national franchise became a huge part of America once again. You know, in the National Football League, if you look at it, and again, let's just look at Dancing with the Stars. Donald Driver is a great chance to win tonight. He has a great chance to win. You know, Emmett Smith, the great running back of the Dallas Cowboys, won that competition. Heinz Ward, the great receiver of the Pittsburgh Steelers, won that competition. Were they good dancers? Were they great and athletic? Is dancing is an athletic sport now? Yes. Were they the best dancers? Probably not. But the fan vote is so important. It's 50% of the equation in that competition. And I'll tell you something, you're talking about the three great franchises in the NFL today. The three most popular franchises, pick your order, Dallas Cowboys, Pittsburgh Steelers, Green Bay Packers. Those are the top franchises in terms of fan loyalty and support, in terms of nat national stature in America today in the National Football League. They really are. And, and that's why Donald Driver has a great chance of becoming the third football player to win that competition. You know, we talk about how uh, sports is, is somewhat become a way of life, and Tom mentioned, and I think brings up a very good point, is it really healthy around here that, that the outcome of the Packers game on Sunday dictates the mood of an entire state on Monday? Is that really healthy? Have we gotten caught up a little bit too much? I know that's wrong for me to even think, but uh, I gotta tell you, I'm right with you. Because when the Packers lose, I feel down as well. 
I feel like everything's kind of coming apart. And, and I'm as bad as any fan. And, and I, I'm a big, big baseball fan as well. And uh, my youngest son, my oldest son's a White Sox fan. He grew up in Chicago with us. And my youngest son, uh, like me, became a New York Yankee fan because the Yankees, when he was coming of age as a sports fan, were winning titles with Derek Jeter and, and that whole group. When I was in the 60s, the Yankees, I thought, the, by the way, the interlocked NY and the pinstripe uniforms, that also caught my eye. Another reason why I became a fan of that particular baseball team. But we all believe that, that you are a fan of your team. You pick a team as a kid, that's the team you're a fan of. I, I don't believe in this. I don't care where you move or whatever. Your team is your team, and that's the way it is. Well, you know, the Packers are a way of life here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And this, by the way, is the most unique setting you could ever have for a National Football League game, at least in the modern era. And it's such a throwback. And I can tell you this, when I was broadcasting in Kansas City, when I was a broadcaster with Chicago, we as a broadcast group, we as football, as a football team and entity, if you got a game at Lambeau Field in Green Bay, that was marked with red letters. That was circled on the calendar. That would be a special weekend. This is a special place. But part of the reason why it's so special, yes, it's the history. It's the championships won by Curly Lambeau. It's the Lombardi Packers and the, and the great Super Bowl wins that they had in one and two, but also the Ice Bowl, which kind of froze them in time and cemented the Packers as, a, as an America's team type entity. But it's also the people of Green Bay. It's also the fact that you can, a year ago, a friend of mine from Kansas City who had long wanted to come to Green Bay to see a game, we're driving into Green Bay and we're driving along and we're coming up Ridge Road and he keeps saying, where's the stadium? Where's the stadium? I said, oh, you'll see it in a minute. But the trees kind of overshadowed our view of the stadium. And then finally, when we got right to the intersect, oh, there it is right there. I mean, it's in a neighborhood. This is kind of the Wrigley Field and the Fenway Park of the National Football League, all rolled up into one. When I left the Bears, I got a call from a guy I worked with in Chicago uh, with the Cubs, John McDonough, who was a legendary uh, marketer of the Chicago Cubs baseball and now is the president and CEO of the Chicago Blackhawks. And, you know, he called me on the phone. He said, Wayne, most people don't understand why you're leaving Chicago Bears for the Green Bay Packers, but he said, I get it. The Packers are like the Cubs. Lambeau Field's like Wrigley Field, except they win. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what it's all, uh, that's what it's been. But, you know, um, I left, uh, I would never have left the Chicago Bears. And somebody threw this out on Twitter the other night, and they said, Wayne, how could you have left Chicago You'd be going into your 28th year as, as voice of the Bears. You'd be a legend in Chicago if you had stayed. And, you know, I, I, that kind of took me uh, by surprise. I hadn't thought of it that way, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, when I got into this business and I kind of, I thought I'd always be an NBA basketball broadcaster. That's what I always envisioned coming out of college. But one thing led to another. I ended up doing a lot of football. And... Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs job came along at a very young age, and, and so that kind of set the course for my career. I would be doing National Football League games. But I'd always told people, I said, you know, if I could ever, if you had to do this, if you had to do a National Football League game every weekend of the year um, in the fall, the best place to do that would be Lambeau Field in Green Bay. I always believed that. And... Uh, so through the years, seven years in Kansas City, 14 more years, uh, the best years of my life in Chicago, uh, that had always been my thought. Yeah, you know, if you had to do NFL football, especially if you had to do it on radio, where you get to really call the game, you'd want to do it in Green Bay. That's where you'd really want to do it, where people really care, where this is a part. Packers Radio is a part of the fabric of, of a Sunday afternoon in Green Bay. I think back to the 60s and I wasn't here. I was a kid uh, growing up in Massachusetts. But back in the day, in the 60s, television was such a threat to the attendance of the National Football League at the stadiums, or at least they believed it was, that when your team played at home, that game was not shown on local TV, if you recall. 
Some, some back there are nodding your heads. Don't do that. You don't want to date yourself. I, I, I'm old enough for all of us here. <laughs> but that game was not on TV. So all through those great years in the 60s, a man by the name of Ted Moore broadcast the Green Bay Packers during the Lombardi era. Ted Moore should be in the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. It's a travesty that he's not. Ray Scott is in the Hall of Fame. He's the guy I grew up on. Ray Scott doing the television for CBS TV on the Packers. Jim Irwin, my predecessor and good friend. Uh, no question, absolutely, deserves to be and was very proud to walk into the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. A legend in these parts and one of the finest people I've ever known and one of the finest broadcasters I've ever heard. Um, and we lost Jim last January, and uh, uh, we miss him dearly. Uh, and uh, my goodness, he and Max McGee, through 25 years of matriculating through the desert, <laughs> they were marshalling the troops on Sunday afternoon on Packers Radio. And this was back in the days, and I remember this very clearly in Chicago. And I had the great fortune of getting to Chicago just in time for the 85 Bears, one of the great single seasons in the history of the league by any team. But at that time, so many people in so many different markets took television, turned down the sound. They used to advertise this in Chicago on the sides of billboards. Turn down the television sound, turn on the Bears on WGN. They did the same thing here in Wisconsin, and people did it by the millions. Now, today technology has changed a little bit of that. Today, uh, you, you can view the game a number of ways. Over the air and antenna TV, on cable, on satellite, you can do it in, in standard format or HD. I'm talking about four or five different types of formats that you're watching TV on. It's impossible to sync the radio up to all of those different formats. So consequently, for local people watching on TV, they don't sync up to the radio, and I don't blame them. Those who tell us once in a while, hey, we, we turn down the sound of the TV, we listen to you on radio, I always say, God bless you, because either we're way ahead of them or they're way ahead of us, one way or the other. Uh, it just doesn't sync up. But boy, back in the day, it wasn't that long ago, some 15 years ago, before HD and before all this satellite TV, um, you know, radio and television could be synced together. And, and it was quite a marriage, and it was really something. Now today, all right, today in my line of work in our business, NFL football is still a huge deal on radio. And it's not because people are sitting home watching TV and listening to us, it's because people are hearing us around the world. Because our games now are on satellite. Our games are on the internet. You can hear us all over the world, and people do. And uh, you know, that has been wonder wonderful for us. The other thing that's happened with, with local radio, NFL films, Steve Sable, whose dad is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Steve uh, uh, got into the business right with his dad and chronicled much of the Lombardi era on film. And what you'll see, I'm sure, at some point of this conference, if I'm not mistaken, it was supposed to be tonight, might be some other time during the conference, is the Super Bowl 45 uh, uh, film, NFL films all over that, and a lot of local radio play-by-play -play on that film. NFL Films started doing this in the 70s, taking radio play-by-play, -play, not television, and putting it, marrying it to their video. And it, was, it's, it really enhances what they do. And they do it in all, for all teams uh, across the NFL, and it's really a lot of fun to be a part of that. And those are the things that, that uh, I think people look forward to today. Now, what I wanted to do, and you're probably wondering what this is all about, uh, this is an exercise I usually do when I speak with uh, uh, college classes, be they broadcasting or marketing or whatever. Um, I, I've had the great honor and pleasure to work both in radio and TV. And for many years, and, and I don't do it as much now because, quite frankly, I don't want to work that hard, but I would do a college football game on regional television on ESPN on Saturday and then a radio game on Sunday. The calls are entirely different. The emphasis is entirely different. Radio is a small, intimate group of people working together. Radio is your board op back at the flagship station, your producer at the flagship station, your engineer at the game site, your statistician, your spotter, your color man, and maybe a producer in the booth. 
Television is probably 60 to 100 different people, all of whom have to be on the same page on a telecast. Camera people, you've got producer, director, they're constantly talking to you, telling you where you're going to go. The video, you have to, you have to understand that whereas I can tell you with my eyes and my voice what's going on on radio, and I can make that selection. On television, I've got to be a little bit more married to what you see on TV. Because if you don't, as one director once told me one time, he said, listen, if they don't see it on TV, it didn't happen. And it's true. Now, two things happen at a telecast. Television is the ultimate team sport in broadcasting. Ultimate team sport. The, the reason for that is that if I'm talking about somebody, if I want to talk, I've got a story on Aaron Rodgers, I hit my talk back, I can talk to my producer and director, say, get a shot of Aaron Rodgers on the sidelines. Once they do, I tell my story. By the same token, big play, producer's saying, okay, we got this from a side angle, this replay, he's telling me that, I'm setting up the color guide, okay, here we go to this replay, he describes what happened or why it happened, if he's a good color man, uh, a good analyst. So there is that constant give and take back and forth. I have to understand and see what's on the screen knowing that that's what I have to pretty much address. And, and to be honest with you, for an old radio guy, sometimes I watch the field too much and not enough the screen. And when I go back and watch a game, I say, boy, I should have mentioned something about that. They showed a shot of the coach there. I should have said something. He made some kind of a, a movement. There was something, it would have been poignant to say something about this. Um, but really for play-by-play, -play, the real basis of play-by-play -play on television is to frame the picture. Just frame it. Some kind of salient point to describe what just happened. On radio, you paint the whole picture. So what I'm going to show you, about four, maybe five plays from the uh, 2008 divisional playoffs, Green Bay Packers, Seattle Seahawks, the, the picture's a little fuzzy because if you recall, that was the famous snow globe game at Lambeau Field, Seattle and Green Bay. What I'm going to show you first is we're going to hear the Fox telecast. Uh, um, this is uh, Kenny Albert, uh, Moose Johnson, uh, I believe uh, uh, Tony Segura on this call of this particular game. And then you'll hear Larry McCarron and myself uh, the same four or five plays. And I want you to see the difference contrast the difference in the way the play is called. So here we go. That gives you a little bit of an indication of uh, the difference in, that's a very good television call and a radio call. There's a huge difference in the emphasis of verbiage. With the uh, television call, it's about Moose Johnson and his description of what happened or why it happened. And the same thing with Tony Saragusa. They do a wonderful job. And Kenny Albert's one of the top play-by-play -play television guys in the business. And with the radio side, though, as you know, again, what, where is the ball? What yard line? Is it first down, second down? How many yards to go? That type of thing. And then just the word descriptions, you know, pierces through off the left side. Kenny Albert's call, hand off Grant. Doesn't have to say any more than that. You can see he went off the left side of the line. So people, you know, mistake a television call. People used to say to me, God, you sounded nothing on television like you did on radio today. You were so much more into the game today on radio. And I always tell people, and that's not really true, but it's a different emphasis. Television is a cool medium from a broadcast standpoint. Radio is a hot medium, and that's the difference. I, I hope that gave you a little bit of an indication of, of the difference. I, I use this with students, especially broadcast students on, on the college level, because it, it does kind of give you an idea of a little bit of a difference. Uh, you can't really, you do a radio call on TV, and it becomes very annoying you can't do a television call on radio, people sitting out there in the car, you have to think of the person driving along out there in the interstate wondering, where's the ball, what town is it, who's got the ball, you know, that kind of thing. And, but the worst thing we do in our, my business, we always forget to tell you the score. <laughs> we never tell you the score it up, it seems like. And that's something that uh, I think that's been happening for as long as we've been broadcasting. But I hope that gives you a little uh, indication, a little glimpse into my world. And, um, you know, again, I'm very happy to be here, wonderful to be here. I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. We, do we have some time, Tom, a, a little bit? Any questions uh, 